Hi, it's Jerry Roberts back with another episode of Newsmakers Journal of the Plague Year. And today we are speaking with another uh, of our candidates for the Santa Barbara Unified School District Board of Education. Uh, we're speaking with uh, Elrod McLearn, who is a health inspector for the County of Santa Barbara. Thank you so much for, uh, for being with us and taking the time. Thank you, Jerry, for uh, having me on. It's uh, my pleasure. I've watched some of your other episodes and whatnot, and I've really enjoyed them. Uh oh, I'm much taller in real life. I would <laughs> tell you that. Um, let me let me ask you first. Uh, what led you to decide to run for the school board? Uh, what what would you like to accomplish uh, as a board member? Well, that's an excellent first question, and I think it's the definite first question for any candidate is why you're running. And I believe that uh, literacy is a basic fundamental human right that has not been afforded to the children within the SB Unified District. Um, additionally to that, I believe that the children have not only been denied this fundamental right, but they also have been set up for failure from the onset with a lack of transparency, with a lack of parental involvement, and a kind of instruction that teaches these minority students, because we have a lot of Hispanic students in our district, that teaches these minority students that they are oppressed and that they are not able to succeed unless these oppressors are removed from their position. So for those reasons, I'm running for this district um, board member position. And those are the reasons and the issues that I seek to redress and correct um, when I get elected to the board. Okay. Um, so as a political matter, we got um, three seats are, uh, are up. There's eight candidates running, uh, three quasi incumbents who got their positions um, because nobody else signed up to run. Uh, yeah. How closely have you followed what's been going on in the district in the last year or two? You know, I have been attending as many uh, board meetings as I could. And so I've been, you know, keeping up with the agendas, uh, keeping up with what's happening within the districts within the past year or so. And also, that's another reason why I'm running is because from being a community member and going to these district meetings, I've seen just how disconnected the board is from the desires of the people. Uh, being an elected representative, uh, every board member is basically a conduit of the desires of the electorate. And those are the parents, even the teachers and the other faculty that are there. And it is this idea that the board knows what's best not the parent. And I believe that obviously the parent knows what's best for their child. They, it's their child. They're the ones that live with them. They know how their child thinks, how their child learns, and no one's going to want any better opportunity for their child than the parent. So in, in seeing that and in, in going to these board meetings, I've realized that the board members have not put the best interests of the parents uh, for their students there. So you feel like there's a disconnect between Definitely. the board and really the interest of the parents. Do you, you yes. feel like they're acting on behalf of the administration or the teachers? I would think so. Uh, and in talking about some of the past um, big controversial uh, things that have happened with this board. And I think that's also why we see a lot more candidates now in the race is because people are starting to wake up and they're seeing this disconnect and they're realizing, you know, hey, this board doesn't have my interest. And I think they're also realizing that they have the ability to vote people out of office. And during the beginning of this year, when there was a lot of talk about the teen talk curriculum and uh, the implementation of a new sex ed curriculum within this school, a lot of parents um, got together, big grassroots movement came, and there were several hundred parents that came to a couple of the meetings, and I was there watching, and their parents said, hey, we don't want this curriculum, and the board continued to go on with their own way in their own method with uh, they wanted to do team talk and a lot of the parents 
who opposed the team talk curriculum uh, supported this other curriculum, which was called the heart curriculum. And I think as a board member, you have to be willing to have that dialogue with the parents. And if they are wanting something for their children, then that definitely should be something that is, you know, supported. And I also made a speech uh, during that one of those meetings. And, you know, I talked to the board and I said, you know, there is elections. And this was in January, February. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, come November, parents are not going to forget the reticence of the board to have these discussions and to engage with the parents. Parents are not going to forget that. And they're going to make their voices heard come this November 3rd. And we can clearly see that's what's happening now. All right, let me, let me back up to um, uh, what you were saying uh, about um, the achievement uh, specifically of minority students that you mentioned. The test scores, uh, as you know, a 45% yeah. grade level proficient in math, 56% uh, grade level proficient in English language arts, uh, and then obviously that's called the learning gap, uh, yeah. students of color generally uh, uh, Latino uh, scores much lower than whites. What would you do as a board member that hasn't been done? How would you address that issue? So first off, I would want to say that, yes, there is an achievement gap. And no, it has nothing to do with a person being a minority. It has nothing to do with them being low income. It has nothing to do with their, you know, cultural status or anything like that, I would say specifically why this is an issue and why is there, there is a gap is because the parents don't have a lot of times being low income, they don't have the, the time and the ability to make sure that their children are, you know, doing their homework, making sure that they're, they're getting these extra supplemental things, which in all honesty, is the requirement of the district. If a child is struggling or if they need some extra help, uh, the, the school, the teachers, the faculty, and all that need to be the ones who are coming alongside the student when the parent cannot be there. In that vacuum of the parent, the school district needs to come in and assist the child. Uh, I personally have taught my siblings um, several grade levels actually and uh and i said this uh, in a little bit in the independent article but you know my parents divorced and i was in a sense the de facto parent my mother was working my dad was on the home and being one of the older siblings i was the one that had to take the kids to school and we didn't have any money we were on social programs you know we didn't really have any, we were going to the food pantry all the time and there was no money to hire tutors or anything like that or go to private school. So I was relying on the public school system to educate my younger siblings. So in, in doing that, I was basically hoping and praying like, hey, I have two jobs. I can't you know, do anything but work to make sure that there's food on the table and hope and pray that the school is educating them appropriately. And after several years of doing that, actually they weren't learning anything. And so I took it upon myself to, I got another job and I started working the graveyard shift. Uh, so I, during the day could teach them, I pulled them out of the public school because there was also some other issues that were going on. One of my younger brothers, he was struggling in, in the school as what I've seen them doing here in Santa Barbara they keep pushing the kids to the next grade level and they're not coming alongside helping a child who actually is struggling so I pulled them out of the public school system and I took it upon myself to start educating them and in doing so and giving them that individualized attention they were able to read proficiently perform their math computations well above average. And additionally, a lot of my siblings now have gone to be rather successful in their lives and things that they've done 
because they've had that basic education of reading and doing their math and things. So like when that. you think about being a board member and applying that life experience that you just described exactly. to this large district, um, uh, are you saying that uh, parents and families should have a greater choice in how their uh, kids are educated? Are you saying we need to expand homeschooling or charters or what, what would be the practical, how would that look? So solutions. I think a great thing to look at is Franklin School uh, with um, how they have kind of modeled their school on a smaller class size they have engaged the parents, brought about a lot of transparency and created, as I said before, this place where a child, no matter what they're dealing with or if they're struggling with reading or math or science or something, the school has created this one-stop shop appeal where they can remediate what a child's struggling with. And I think Casey Kilgore has done a, an excellent job in doing the principal, that. The principal of Franklin. It, it has saddened me to see the board not take that model in whole and incorporate it to every other elementary school. And not just elementary school. Why aren't we doing this in junior high and high school? Uh, one of the things that I had uh, done is I've done a lot of research in an undergrad at UCLA in active learning styles. And so what we did, instead of having a, a professor just talk down in this monologue to the rest of the students, we would engage each student in group learning and take some of the highest achieving students in that classroom and train them to become teacher's aides. And so you had smaller individualized instruction in each class. You have, instead of one teacher, you now have 10, 15, 20 teachers. In addition to that, you have the student's learning responsibility and becoming more mature in their critical thinking and in this whole life cycle of becoming an adult. All right. So, Let me, oh, uh, yeah. it, it, you, you've been following, obviously, the controversies, as you say, at the board. And, um, you yeah. know, one of, the, one of the most visible ones has been about implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this uh, substantial contracts that have gone to uh, just communities, the nonprofit, uh, to do that. Um, there, there have been concerns expressed uh, both about the content of that and also the way the contract was awarded, whether there was and whether there is transparency in the in the materials themselves. Where where, where do you come down in that whole uh, controversy? Well, Jerry, I think that. For one, I would say that's a kind of a secondary um, issue because we need to first be able to teach children how to read and how to computate math. You mean implicit bias is a secondary issue or? That or is a secondary issue because if we can't, if a child can't read or write, how are they going to be even successful? If a child does not know how to think critically, how are they going to be able to even assuage any kind of racial bias or anything else? We have to know how to read, write, and think in order to be successful in what we do. So this, this implicit bias, tra bias training is, is great, it, it, you know, but I think as an educational institution, we have lost sight of what really matters. And what really matters is someone being able to read and write. Now, I also would say that my parents were not uh, college educated. And they were, but they saw um, the importance of reading and writing. And going back to when I was younger and my parents were together, we um, were homeschooled, I was homeschooled. And even though my parents didn't know, you know, or have this college education and all that, they understood that reading and writing were the fundamental things to success. So you're saying, if, if I, I just want to be sure I'm hearing you. Yes. So you're saying that uh, the direction that the district has been on uh, really emphasizing 
uh, uh, quote unquote equity, cultural competencies, things of that category, uh, are uh, have lost sight of the more fundamental uh, purpose and and role of uh, of what the schools ought to be doing. Is that is that a fair characterization? I would say for the most part so. Um, you know, I'm a person of color myself, right? And I, as I said, have come from a very disadvantaged background. You know, um, there wasn't any um, financial support or anything like that throughout my academic career, but I was able through starting with the fundamentals of writing, reading, comprehension, critical thinking, et cetera, I was able to become successful in what I've done. And I didn't, I didn't have any implicit bias training or anything like that. And no one told me, oh, there is someone who's oppressing you. What I was taught was I have the mind and I have the capacity and the ability to succeed. And so I took that. And I was able to rise to become a successful person that I am today because of that. And I think to tell a child, you know, you're oppressed, it, it in a sense cuts the legs out from under them because they're not relying on them own, their own selves and they're thinking, oh, I can't do it because I'm oppressed. No, we need to empower our, our children. We need to teach them that they can do it. And what we clearly see in Franklin School is they're about 90% Hispanic. Yet. And since they first started doing the CAS scores, they have risen roughly 33% in both math and in English. And those are you know, minority students, low income. And so, as I said, and to start all this, the low income, the minority status, and the socioeconomic standing of the child has nothing to do with their academic ability when the school can come up alongside them and enable them and give them that success. So I want, I want to pick up on a, on a word you've used a couple times about uh, minority students uh, uh, being oppressed or, or being uh, uh, having a perspective of their being an oppressor and being oppressed. And, you know, it, it, if, if we back up from that, it really, um, sort of captures a lot of the, I think, political debate in the country that's going on right now uh, about issues like critical race theory. Uh, we saw Black Lives Matter uh, make a very uh, strong and successful presentation to the board uh, earlier. Um, but uh, do you feel like that uh, when kids are told, you know, there is an oppressor, you are oppressed, they're being, uh, their individuality is being lost. Is that what you're saying? And they're being told they're part of a group rather than an individual? No, I, I'm not saying things like that at all. Uh, I'm saying that we are not giving them the tools to be successful. Teaching them critical race theory or teaching them about culture, those things are good and those things are necessary but it's not going to be what will grant someone success. And we know that, for example, there have been many great um, minority people. For example, some of my favorite um, you know, characters in black history have been people like Booker T. Washington, who founded Tuskegee Institute, or James Washington Carver, uh, a, a wonderful scientist who revolutionized Southern agriculture and came about and told them how to do crop rotation and all these kinds of things that we still use today. And those individuals and a host of others were successful because they became educated and they were able to rise their, raise their standing because they had an education and people like Booker T. Washington, what he did is he was able to give further education to other black people. And changed an entire generation in doing that. And that's what we need to do here within our community. And as I keep pointing out with Franklin Elementary, this is what they're doing there. And as we see, their scores have gone leaps and bounds. And so more not, attention to individual education um, mm -hmm. 
plans and approaches. Oh, so, sorry, Jerry, I did not, I missed what you said, please repeat. Uh, I, so I, I'm just, I, in trying to summarize the approach that, that yeah. you describe, it's, it's more individualized instruction for students than we're getting now. Yes, uh, as I said earlier, what we need to do is we need to be able to shrink the classroom size. I think what uh, Ms. Kilgore did and Franklin was excellent, bringing in the retired teachers and helping those students who were struggling, creating this rotational system was excellent. Uh, and also, even in the regular classroom with all the students, they had a lot of group learning and whatnot, and it was very hands-on. So those kind of things, which we are changing the learning style, is very necessary. Additionally, we try to come up with this one-size-fits-all type of learning, and it doesn't work. And that's another thing, uh, you know, with the current district is we have, or there is this, this idea that, you know, we've done these things before, so we're going to keep doing them. And it doesn't work. All right, okay. let, me, let me switch topics because I don't want to run out of time here. Yeah. Um, what what uh, would be your criteria or the criteria that you would see as necessary and sufficient to reopening classrooms, to getting to, to, to transitioning from distance learning back to uh, classroom uh, learning? What would be the requirements? What would be the criteria? Yeah, from your perspective. Well, I think um, for starters, uh, Governor Newsom and the State Health Department have clearly set guidelines uh, for reopening. So do you think those uh, are individualized enough? Do you think those are local enough? No, in all honesty, I, I think the local community needs to be able to make that decision. Once again, going back to uh, the parents, uh, when a parent is like, is saying, I want my child to learn, I want them to be able to have this academic success, especially if they're struggling and other things and they're younger, they're elementary students, they're not going to be able to pay attention really to a, a Zoom meeting for several hours at a time. So I think, yes, number one, it does have to be more localized. And, um, you know, the board has to be willing to make those necessary arrangements and requirements. And I do think that the schools need to be reopened in a very safe and effective manner. And some of the criteria for that has already been set in place by the state as well. And if you are a K through nine school, currently you can get a waiver from the state health department to open up your school. Even if your county is on the state watch list for COVID. So those things have been in place and the criteria has been set, but the board has not been willing to do that. Much to the chagrin of parents, and what we see is a lot of parents are taking their kids out of school, and we see pods on the rise. We see other types of homeschooling on the rise. Uh, other private type schools and things our parents are turning to because they see, as I said before, this lack of engagement with the board and parents. Okay, uh, in terms of the budget and finances, um, been a well publicized. Uh, problem with the food services program, a lot of criticism around uh, the armory situation, the, the stadium. Uh, what, what assessment would you offer in terms of the financial uh, uh, fiduciary responsibility that the board is, uh, is exercising? Number one, transparency. So if you went up to the average parent and asked them, you know, how much money is the board spending on their child? They wouldn't know. They would have no idea. Uh, you know, we throw out, you know, the several million dollars that the board spent on the armory or that they spent on the football stadium. And we're like, wow, you know, the board is spending a lot of money, which they are. And it needs to be very clear on how much money is allocated for their students and how much money is being allocated for the facilities and the upkeep and things of that nature. So I think number one, uh, it needs to be very clear 
what money is being spent, how it's being spent, and why it's being spent. I think in regards to the armory, there's a lot of confusion onto why it was bought, and no one really knows. And from someone who's been paying attention to this, I'm not really sure myself. So there, number one, there needs to be some transparency in how the money is being spent. And how that's being communicated as well. In other words, you're how saying- it's being communicated, paid it, communicated to the parents as well as to every individual citizen living within the district. Our property taxes, for example, are going to paying for these things. And I just don't want my money to go to something that I don't agree with, nor do I want to happen. And so there needs to be a lot more transparency and there needs to be a lot more dialogue between how the board spends their money and how the community wants it to be spent. All right. So, so bottom line, Elrod, what I, what I hear you saying is the parents really are not being heard at the district. Is that, is, and, and you would be a tribune of, of that voice? They're not being heard. No, not at all. Uh, they're not being heard about the finances. They're not being heard about the curriculum. Uh, this ethnic studies that just came uh, through as a result of uh, the graduation requirement for ethnic studies and this current uh, BLM um, resolutions that the board passed and agreed to, uh, no parent was asked what they thought about it. And whether a, you like it or whether you don't, you still should you know, ask a parent, hey, this is what we're going to teach your child. Uh, what do you think about it? And are you okay with this? Do you want maybe another curriculum? And things of that nature should be asked, should be discussed, instead of just making this thing and then giving it and not telling a parent what's going on. Yeah. So definitely communication between a parent and the school and transparency as well with the community. All right, very good. All right, L. L. Rod McLaren, thank you uh, so much for your time. And if people want to know more uh, about you and your campaign, do you have a website? Where should uh, they? Uh, how do they get in touch with you? Yes, I do have a website. Uh, it's called LearnWithMcLaren.com, and they can LearnWithMcLaren.com. Yes, okay. Learn with McLaren. and uh, that's where they can go to, um, I guess, find more information, uh, volunteer, donate and support this kind of things. All right, thanks again so much for your time. Thank you, Jerry. Be safe. Been a pleasure.